Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing Ohio's first female architects. Uh, this webinar was brought in part through funding from the Ohio Department of Development and the Ohio Arts Council. So today we have two great speakers from Schooly Caldwell. First up is Melinda Shaw. Uh, Melinda has been an architect of Schooly Caldwell for over 20 years, working on historic buildings for public and private clients. Uh, and also today we have Amanda Fusen. Amanda is an architectural designer with School in Caldwell and she's been with the firm since 2015. A few of the projects she's worked on that you may recognize in the central Ohio area are the Hoster Brewery, the Newark Arcade and the Perry County Courthouse. A few quick things before we get started today. Uh, first off, if you experience any issues with your webinar, more than likely it is just your internet signal delaying. So all you need to do is close down the webinar, click the link that was sent to you, open it back up, and everything should be taken care of. Likewise, if you're using a telephone for your sound, just call back in with the numbers provided and that should solve your sound problems for you. Uh, and finally, uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask our panelists today, you can type those into the chat box at any time. We're going to get to the questions after the presentation, so just type them in when you have them and we'll get to them before the end of the webinar. Thank you guys and we'll turn it over to Melinda and Amanda. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, we're very excited to be uh, talking about this today. Um, when Heritage Ohio first asked us to talk about this, um, Back about a month and a half ago, we're like, yeah, this will be great. How, how are we ever going to possibly narrow it down so it fits in an hour? Um, then we started looking and looking. So um, go ahead and manage if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so a little background. In Ohio, we have 76 national landmarks. We have 4,100 plus listings on the National Register of Historic Places and over 1,750 historic markers. Surely you would think with all those historic resources, again, this would be walk in the park to pick a few that are designed by women architects. Well, not so much. So we started trying to come up with the list um, and looking at this um, and still struggling with it, did what any smart woman does. We called in a few other um, women that are in the preservation field to help us out. So. This is a result of Amanda and I, as well as a few people in our office, but also wanted to give a big thanks to um, Nathalie Wright, Judy Williams, and Barb Powers at um, the Ohio Historical uh, Society and the Shippo office for making suggestions to us because it is not as easy to find um, buildings that are attributed to women as we had hoped. So a little background why that might be. Um, go ahead, Amanda. So, you know, you're thinking about this, there's a lot of buildings, there's a lot of things on the National Register, but in 1958, only 1% of architects were women. So that automatically, you know, if you think most of the buildings on the register were um, designed before 1958. So all of a sudden, that's a lot less buildings that you're looking at. And even if you think, okay, well, now surely the, the buildings in the 60s and 70s are more, um, they're, they're eligible now, but even then, by 1988, only 4% of registered architects in the U.S. were female. Um, and even as of 1999, that was only 13.5%, and now it's still only about 17%. So if you're talking a building that was truly designed by a female architect, this is having a big impact on it. So go ahead. So as I mentioned, we reached out to our friends in the preservation community, some of which I know are joining us today. So thank you ladies for helping. Um, but we picked um, 11 different women that are all associated with Ohio in some way. Some of them um, were born and grew up here. Um, some of them were educated here. Other ones um, practiced here. So these are, and they're, they all have a first of some kind with them. So these are the 11 that we're going to be focusing on. Go ahead. Yeah, and with these um, historic female architect examples, we'll try to relate them to one another as contemporaries, highlight the development of the path to architecture that each of them faced and showcase some of their work, again, as Melinda mentioned, focusing on both buildings built in Ohio, but also um, elsewhere throughout the country with Ohio roots. So beginning with um, Alice Johnson, she was one of Ohio's first female architects, the daughter of nationally known architect John Johnson of Fremont, Ohio, 
Um, she was never formally tr educated or trained in architecture, and instead she apprenticed at her father's firm, who was a prominent Victorian architect, um, focusing mostly on public buildings such as jails, churches, um, courthouses. She um, herself was listed as an architect as early as 1889 in the city directory, which is incredible considering most um, women weren't allowed in, um, to even attend certain colleges at that point. Um, upon her father's death in 1901, she inherited the practice and successfully ran it for over 30 years, um, working again mostly in Northwest Ohio. The Trinity um, Methodist Church that you see here was designed in the Gothic Revival style and is one of the few buildings that is completely attributed to her. And upon her death, the newspaper, the local newspaper praised her for being um, an incredible architect and businesswoman, but also that she was one of the very few women in the United States um, to win recognition in a field dominated uh, mostly by men. Um, a contemporary of Johnson's was Lois Lily Howe. She was um, born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1865, but we'll see um, she has professional ties to Ohio. Uh, she had a strong interest in architecture, but was initially discouraged from entering the field, um, later reflecting that she was always interested in houses, but was um, brought down and discouraged from entering the field by pastors and fathers and um, different family members. In contrast to the apprenticeship route that Alice Johnson had taken, she actually attended MIT and obtained a bachelor in science, um, working as a draftsman throughout Boston after graduation. And she was also most notably the first woman elected as a fellow of the American Institute of Architects in 1931. Um, although there's, I don't know if it's true, but they mentioned that it might've been because her name is Lois and they confused it for Louis. Um, and spent most of her career designing and renovating large houses for wealthy families. Um, one thing that I do want to note is that a lot of um, women in this era were kind of um, just working in the residential sector, not because they wanted to or was their first choice, but because women were still, you know, that was a safe space for women to design in was the domestic sphere. Um, so they got their start from commissions from family members um, and built their practice from there. Um, How invited a fellow MIT graduate, Eleanor Manning O'Connor, to join her in forming the firm um, How Manning and Almy, and it was actually only the second um, female architecture firm in the United States, and they focused mostly on renovating and remodeling structures. Um, How brought her expertise for revival architecture, um, and O'Connor brought this understanding and um, concern for public housing and urban planning, which was really important when you think about after World War I, there was a concern for providing decent housing for all and affordable housing options. So the firm was actually commissioned in 1924 to contribute to Denny Place, located in the planned community of Marymount, um, just outside Cincinnati, Ohio. The planned community was funded by um, local philanthropist Mary Emery, and it was distinctive in that um, it incorporated town planning, architectural, and landscape design um, akin to the English garden style or garden city and the American um, city beautiful movement. And the work um, by Howe and O'Connor was kind of this um, merging together of, again, the understanding of English revival styles, but also a deep concern for public housing. And when the firm disbanded, it um, had actually um, completed over 400 projects. Um, jumping back to another one of our very own Ohio-born female architects, Theodate Pope Rib Pope Riddle um, was born in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1860s and actually changed her name from um, Effie to Theodate in honor of her grandmother, which I thought was interesting. Um, she grew up in Cleveland where her father was president of a local factory and she really grew up as an only child um, of privilege in an era where she was expected to focus on family and social prominence. Um, her family traveled the world and cultivated um, a sense of appreciation for art and culture. Uh, she actually survived the sinking of the Lusitania, which I thought was incredibly interesting. Um, and then she graduated from Miss Porter School in Connecticut, um, which is, you know, a typical path for a woman of um, 
um, her social status, but she always dreamed of living in the country and building schools and caring for um, orphan children. And her interest from um, revival architecture grew out of um, going to school in Farmington, Connecticut, and also traveling the world and seeing these um, English countryside and English revival uh, styles. Um, so in, after graduating from school, instead of returning to Cleveland um, to claim her proper place in society, she hired Princeton faculty to train her in architecture since most, or Princeton did not accept women at the time. Um, still in an uh, era where women just didn't have the option to be formally educated on the same level um, that um, men were allowed to. And she um, eventually became the first woman to become licensed in New York in 1916 and completed a lot of residential work such as um, Hillstead located in Farmington, Connecticut. And that's the drawing that you see here, um, the plan and floor plan. It was completed for her parents, who she convinced to move there with the help of her friends at McKim, Mead and White. Um, and Hillstead was de designed in the colonial revival style with the intention of creating these elegant spaces um, in which her family could entertain and um, her parents could um, display their impressive art collection that they'd collected traveling the world. And um, surrounding the house, she created these this uh, working farm and gardens, uh, which was her dream at the time, both you know ornamental gardens, but also vegetable gardens. Um, and it spoke to her fascination with the English countryside and but also incorporated modern amenities such as plumbing, heating and cooling, and eventually electricity. Um, but she faced, a challenge um, that you know was rampant throughout all of um, women or female architects careers at the time which is credit so at the time that the house was documented in different architectural reviews she was credited with um, her zealous assistance in the interior design of the building um, and not that she had designed um, the house herself um, today obviously she's given full credit um, along with Hillstead, she um, fulfilled her other dreams of designing schools um, in the countryside, designing Westover School in 1909 and Avon Old Farms in 1927, seen here. Um, it was developed, Avon Farms was developed as a private boys school in memory of her father um, and designed um, with inspiration from the Cotswolds in England. She purchased the property with her inheritance money and designed um, and built the school herself, constructed with materials out of local quarries, um, fields and forests. And um, it really showcases her fast showcases her fascination with revival styles, um, but also a sensitivity for material. And um, that understanding of material and craftsmanship was aligned with the arts and crafts movement at the time. Um, she would go on to be appointed um, a fellow of the AIA in 1926, and another notable, notable project I think is interesting. She actually um, was involved in the reconstruction of um, President Theodore Roosevelt's birthplace in 1922, which had been demolished um, several years prior just with um, the development of that neighborhood into more commercial, but um, a group of women founded the Women's Roosevelt Memorial Association and reconstructed um, the building in the 1920s. Oh, there we go. Melinda, I'll hand it back over to you. So, Marion Kruger Coffin, um, moving on a little later. Um, Sorry, I just lost my place too. Um, was another um, more focused on landscape architecture in uh, in Ohio um, rather than strictly architecture. Um, so, but did some work up near Cleveland, um, and primarily the one that's listed in Ohio is the. The Ram Milton Farm Historic District, um, and she's been credited with doing a lot of the landscape architecture around that farm. So it's a little different, um, but still contributing to the landscape around Ohio. Okay. 
This is an image of that farm. So that's up in Mansfield. Oh. Yeah, so within um, a decade or two, the first generation of women um, being accepted and became the first generation of women being accepted into architectural programs. One such being um, Helen Binkard Young, who was born in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and obtained a bachelor's of architecture from Cornell in 1900 and only the 11th woman to do so from Cornell. Um, despite her impressive education, she was unable to find a lot of work as an architect um, or teaching architecture. And actually after graduation, she became an unpaid professor at, um, in the Cornell Home Economic Department. And her publications are actually still used um, um, and studying housing design, such as the one seen here, The Planning of the Home Kitchen, which was published in 1916. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of her work has been identified, most likely obscured by um, her husband, who was also an architect, and her other male colleagues. She didn't sign a lot of the drawings herself, but um, through local histories, we were able to, um, um, local historians have been able to identify several houses um, these charming revival style houses that are located in um, Cayuga, he Cayuga Heights, um, which is a village in upstate New York. Hidden Home, which is in the upper left of the screen, was actually designed in conjunction with her husband, George Young, who was also um, an architect, and they designed that um, together in the Tudor revival style. Um, and I thought it was interesting, even though she obtained her bachelor's and was most likely designing these homes, um, she listed herself as having no occupation in the 1910 census and didn't identify herself as an architect until the 1930s. This is another interior of Hidden Home and I just, I, you know, it showcases all those Tudor revival details and I love that they um, had the attention to detail to place the dog in the foreground of each picture, which is kind of interesting. So um, another of the first formally educated female architects was Florence Kenyon Hayden, who was born in the 1880s and was actually, is known as the first licensed female architect in the state of Ohio. Um, she also became the first woman to study architecture at OSU in 19, beginning in 1901. She didn't um, finish her degree, but she studied for two years without, um, before beginning her career. Um, not only was she the first licensed architect in Ohio, she was also the only female practicing architect in a, central Ohio until 1930, which is um, incredible that it, you know, it was that recent. Um, one of her more well-known projects um, was the design of Oxley Hall, which was the first dorm at OSU for, built for women in 1910. In a little context, up until that point, women who went to OSU would have had to have either lived in boarding houses or with local families. So this was the first intentional dorm built for women. Um, and Hayden was selected by um, university architect, Joseph Bradford um, to design the dorm um, in the English revival style, uh, in, sorry, English Renaissance style. Um, and while the board of trustees gave her the job, they still required her to be partnered with um, Wilbur T. Mills which allegedly she locked out of the office a month before the due date and um, finished the drawings herself. So what we see is largely attributed to um, Florence and today it houses the Department of International Affairs. Um, you see in the picture on the right, she was also very active in the women's suffrage movement. Um, she was a member of the National Advisory Council um, of the National Women's Party and financial chair actually. Um, along with her work at OSU, she did design some local houses um, in the Columbus area, including these two. The house at 1277 um, East Broad Street being very much in the arts and crafts style, while the one on the left um, on Franklin Avenue, she actually designed for her family and worked out of the third, store, third floor studio. And um, it's a long, narrow, um, fairly modest asymmetrical structure, and it's um, very personal, very eclectic with the different um, um, French doors and the steel casement windows and the stuccoed facade. 
Um, also, interestingly, outside of Ohio, she actually designed the seating plan for the Madison Square Garden in New York City um, for her assisting her uncle who designed it. Um, Luda Maria Riggs is one of the first predominantly 20th century examples, um, born in Toledo, Ohio in um, 1896, where she moved, um, before she moved with her mother to Santa Barbara, California. Um, she never practiced in Ohio, but she had an incredibly successful career and a lot of her own firsts. Um, she, be, uh, she received her Bachelor of Architecture from Berkeley and went on to become the first licensed female architect in Santa Barbara, as well as the first woman in California to be named to um, the Fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Um, she spent a lot of her career as a draftswoman for Spanish Revival architect George Washington Smith, and she was actually made partner at his firm in the 1920s. Um, so a lot of her time at that firm um, she was involved in the renovation of a lot of 19th century cultural buildings that were um, renovated into the Spanish revival style, which was really popular in the 1920s, including the Libero Theater seen here, which um, they converted from an 1870s opera house um, into the Spanish colonial revival style. Another is the El Paseo in um, uh, Santa Barbara, which renovated actually a complex of buildings into a single arcade for vendors and shopping. Uh, she started her own firm in the 1940s, um, and her solo work included the design of uh, the Santa Vedanta Temple in 1956, which up until that point, the, pro uh, the property had been used as a retreat for monks, nuns, um, and lay persons of the Vedanta Society in Hollywood. Um, when she was brought on as the architect, she expressed to the client that she'd never been in a church that she liked, and his response was, um, I give you carte blanche to design one that you do like. Um, I think she did a great job. Um, and during the design process of the temple, it was actually noted by the client that her architectural drawings were painstakingly rendered, and she took the time to draft um, full-scale details such as, um, this isn't the temple itself, but an example of her drawing. She um, drew full-scale details like this section here and um, these renderings that you see here. And she also had a great sensitivity for the landscape and local materiality, which you can kind of get a sense of in this rendering with the, um, the house set in the landscape. India Boyer started at OSU in 1926, and she became the first woman to graduate from OSU architecture in 1930. And I just want to note that that's nearly 30 years after um, Florence Hayden had joined the program in 1901, um, that the first woman um, graduated from the program. Um, a total of six women started in that program, and she was the only one to um, graduate. And I thought it was interesting at the time that the program actually required military training, and in her first year, she said, absolutely not, I'm not going to do that, and they eliminated it um, entirely from the program because of um, her pushback. Uh, there were several competitions that weren't open to her while she was in school just because um, there was a competition that would have allowed students to study abroad in France, and she wasn't allowed to enter just because the school in France didn't have facilities for women. Um, so she missed out on a lot of those study abroad opportunities. Um, sh sorry, she worked um, for university architect um, between her junior and senior years with the intent of um, that being her job after school. Unfortunately, the Great Depression hit and she joined um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to work on flood control projects, um, just because that was the only opportunity um, that she had. Uh, she became licensed in the 1940s, uh, and while there were women who worked as architects before her, as we've seen in this presentation, she was the first woman in Ohio to sit for the state licensure exams. She pivoted from working for the Corps and um, fulfilled her dream of starting private practice, founding the firm Voight Ivers and Associates in Cincinnati, and she became director of the architectural division. 
Um, you can really see the breadth of her work here. On the left, one of her flood control projects was the Beachmont Levee um, built in the 1930s. And um, along with the Romans Department Store renovation, which she completed in 1947, which was a project that extended and remodeled an earlier classicizing building on um, the street facade. And um, the renovation covered the entire building in cast iron concrete panels in more of the international design style. And in addition to her modernist work, she was also um, she also designed the architectural layout, the rail systems, and branch offices for the Ryerson Steel Company in the 1950s, which you see on the left, and also had some involvement in renovation of the Provident Bank building in Cincinnati, Ohio. Melinda, I'll turn it back over to you. So another tie to OSU. Um, Mildred Mig Hawkins Urban um, was a woman in Clintonville, so here in Columbus, who her father was a builder. Um, and although she didn't practice much, she did work with her father as a builder and general contractor some. Um, she Her background was actually in education from OSU. So she did teach for a few years, um, eventually went on and designed there's two cute little stone cottages on High Street uh, in Clintonville and Columbus. One of them was her um, her house, and the other one she was built in 1942, just a few years later, was built as a doctor's office um, for her husband. Now, eventually, um, those uh, she and her husband did live in them uh, for a long time. They were donated to the Knowlton School of Architecture upon her death in 2003. Um, OSU for a long time did not know what to do with these. Um, they had, they did since sell them because originally the intent was to use them for um, visiting faculty because she was always interested in continuing education and um, always learning things. So she thought had thought these would be a great use for that. OSU did sell them and did set up a fund in her name to help housing, traveling faculty and things, but the houses themselves are no longer owned by OSU. The interesting thing is now though, that they are once again a house and the doctor's offices um, actually hold, holds a podiatry clinic now. So. Okay, next. And then the last architect on our list um, was the most recent one. So. Natalie Dubla, uh, who um, was part of SOM. So she was born in 1921, so a little later than most of the other architects we featured. She's originally from Patterson, New Jersey, um, and she actually graduated from Columbia University in New York City in 1944. So still fairly early for a woman to attend any architecture school. Um, and she did graduate uh, shortly after graduation. She started at a firm in New York, but was fired rather quickly after she rebuffed the affections of one of the firm's male architects who then uh, went and complained, said he couldn't work with her um, and she was fired, which is an amazing thing to think uh, of that happening now. Um, in some ways it probably worked out well. Um, she pretty much immediately following that went down a few floors in the same building and got a job with SOM. So Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, um, their office in New York was fairly small at the time. Um, and she had a lot of different opportunities at SOM, um, though for a long time was also not given credit. It wasn't until um, Nathaniel Owings biography came out in 1973 that more um, more buildings started to be attributed to her. And one of the reasons uh, she's included in this talk about um, Ohio and architects in Ohio is she was responsible for the design of the Terrace Plaza Hotel in Cincinnati, which is featured on the left. So um, the, the interesting thing about this, uh, property is it was the very first international style hotel built in the U.S. Um, it is was designed from 1946 and built from 1946 to 1948. So uh, fairly early if you think about it. Um, and also 
if I'm doing the math, she was in her mid twenties at the time she was put in charge of this project. So, um, or as the lead designer, go ahead and use the next slide. So the Terrace Plaza Hotel was designed for uh, Mr. Emery who owned the Netherland Plaza Hotel, which was built in Cincinnati in 1931. That's the one on the left. Um, very classic art deco building. Um, the Heritage Ohio Conference uh, was there a few years ago when it was in Cincinnati. Gorgeous building, but Mr. Emery had always been disappointed that he didn't include another 400 rooms. It was 800 rooms only, and he wanted those extra 400 rooms. So he was patient, and after uh, the Great Depression, World War II were over, um, so just 15 years later, he um, decided that this other site that he had was long, narrow, kind of challenging site. He was going to hire an architect to build a um, revolutionary hotel. Um, the Netherland Plaza had a lot of um, very modern features to it when it was built, so he's looking to keep up with the time. So he selected SOM. Um, to, to design this new hotel. And the interesting thing is they were selected not because of their breadth of hotel experience, but because of their interesting approach to how to deal with this long site and the um, zoning requirements for um, setbacks and things. So um, as I mentioned, Nathalie Dubois was actually the lead designer for this building at, in only her mid twenties, which is very early. So go to the next slide. So the, the Terrace Plaza Hotel, it's a long, narrow site um, to really maximize the return on their investment. The program included having a lot of retail and storefronts on the first floor. They really w wanted to get as much glass in as they could at the ground floor, um, having almost all of it be storefronts because there were two large department stores in this building. So. At the first floor, they wanted those storefronts, wanted all that light in, but then um, the floors above that, all the way through the seventh floor, um, if you remember most department stores in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, even most of the ones built now have very few of any windows. So mm -hmm. that's why you see this big um, masonry base. Um, there's very little windows in it. Those were the department stores. Um, but then on top of that, it had a terrace. So the, as the zoning requ required, it, the building was stepped back. So there was a terrace at the eighth floor with a whole lobby. And this is where the lobby was for the hotel, which was revolutionary at the time too. And from that point up to the 19th floor were, were the 400 extra hotel rooms that Mr. Emery wanted. And then at, Perched on the very top of that was a restaurant called the Gourmet that we'll see in a minute. So this is the entrance to, uh, or at least what the entrance originally looked like to the Terrace Plaza Hotel. Um, very streamlined, very um, modern for its time. And as I mentioned, they were trying to maximize the amount of glass in the storefront. Um, so they had displays play, display places for those retail. Now the impact on that is they did not have anywhere to put the hotel lobby um, because the hotel lobby traditionally there would be the lobby and gift shops and restaurants, meeting rooms, all of that would take up space and they didn't want to take up the space on the first floor. So they wanted to keep it very clean and open. So this was all the lobby there was on the, on the lowest floor or on the mm -hmm. ground level floor. So you walk right in and you're faced with elevators. Go ahead. So instead, the lobby was moved up to the eighth floor and it was called the Sky Lobby. And if you've ever stayed at a hotel in a big city, you, know, you can run into these sometimes, but this was actually the very first time this was done uh, in any hotel. So it was revolutionary at the time. Um, so you came in that street entrance uh, straight up and then you're greeted by this floor that had tall ceilings that had all these windows had this beautiful terrace you could see um, with all these umbrellas and places to sit. Um, in the winter, they even mentioned that there was ice skating out on the terrace. So it was this lively place. Um, and as part of this, they also had a large restaurant. They had artwork. Um, the Terrace Plaza Hotel, um, for that project, Mr. Emery, the hotel owner, 
uh, commissioned SOM to design and install all the artwork, um, plates, furniture, everything to go with it, they got to pick out. So there are artworks throughout the building, or at least there were originally um, by well-known um, artists at that time period. Go ahead. So this is the restaurant at the that Sky Lobby level, um, so, which was a very large restaurant. It originally contained uh, a mural by Saul Steinberg called the Mural of Cincinnati, um, that over that featured all sorts of original um, designs and art and artistic renderings of downtown Cincinnati. It was a popular restaurant for a long time. Go ahead. And then from there, you could go up several floors of hotel rooms. And the hotel rooms were seen as innovative at the time as well, because again, um, Natalie got to pick out, um, along with uh, her colleagues at SOM, the furniture, the fixtures, the, the curtains, everything. The hotel rooms themselves were designed so they could go from being kind of office living room spaces during the day to bedrooms at night, but then um, the even more revolutionary thing was this restaurant up on the top. So up on the very uh, top floor, on the 20th floor, there was this round silver restaurant perched up on um, the building. It was called the Gourmet. This was a French restaurant that was one of the places to eat in Cincinnati for a very long time. Um, and it contained, um, also contained a beautiful mural uh, that was painted by uh, Miro, um, specifically for this restaurant. So sadly, um, the Terrace Plaza Hotel was sold to Hilton in 1956. Um, so it didn't stay like this for very long. When Hilton took over the restaurant, they decided they just didn't want to pay for the insurance with the artwork. It was originally intended that the artwork would stay with the building. Um, so the artwork was all donated to the Cincinnati Art Museum. So you can go see um, the two pieces I showed as well as the Calder Mobile. Um, they're all there um, together. Um, so it was, uh, Hilton held it for a long time. They then sold it to AT&T. We thought, hey, this is great. We want a call center without any windows. So they used um, the base of it for a while and used some of the upper hotel rooms to house guests or offices. Um, and then eventually in the 1990s, it was sold um, to Holiday Inn who purchased it um, and ran it as a Crown Plaza. And I actually remember seeing this hotel before, I, when I was in school and didn't really know its significance um, and going, what is this building? Because um, unfortunately it has kind of fallen on hard times the hotel was abruptly closed in 2008, and there have been several renovation attempts um, made or at least proposed. Um, unfortunately, none of them have uh, took yet. The building, they were trying to get it listed um, on the Cincinnati Register of Historic Places and from the article I read that did not go through. Um, if anyone else know, has some better news, please let us know in the chat. Um, so the, this building is still kind of waiting. Um, for its next chapter, which is sad because um, you know, not only is it an important um, work of architecture by a female architect, a prominent female architect in Ohio, it was also you know, revolutionary for all the things I mentioned. It was also very much a stepping stone in its massing toward the design of the Lieber House in New York. Um, and researchers now believe uh, and that's always kind of held up as this quintessential piece that you study in architectural history of uh, international style architecture. And the Lieber brothers had rented offices in the, um, the Terrace Plaza Hotel in the couple of years prior to commissioning SOM to design their building. So there's a tie in for that. So where do we go from here? So there have been, um, you know, that's kind of, we're, we're up to our 50 year mark um, in buildings that are created by um, women architects um, that are eligible for listing on the National Registry. Um, different AIA groups, as well as other um, women architecture groups have been trying to focus more on making sure women get the credit they deserve for different um, projects around. This is 
images of a display that was done by the um, AIA of Ohio Valley um, a couple of years back about projects that were designed all over Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, um, trying to make sure people get credit. And it's interesting because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are not a lot of women in the profession. It's um, starting to change, but also, you know, architecture, especially these big public projects or large complex commercial projects aren't just designed by one person. So it is, they are all commonly accredited to a firm. And then even when they are accredited to a firm, how do you know who in the firm worked for them? So it's a bit of a struggle. Amanda, if you can go to the next slide. So kind of looking towards the future, where are we going to go from here? Um, there are a number of buildings that are being built by women architects, um, usually in conjunction with others. Um, the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati was uh, designed by Zaha Hadid, obviously nowhere near 50 years old, not necessarily considered historic yet, but it was the first um, building in the U.S. built by her. Um, she was a, one of the first, or the first woman to win, win a Pritzker Prize, so it's certainly a noteworthy building um, in Cincinnati. There's um, the Ohio State, Ohio State University chiller plant that if you've ever driven up and down 315 um, in Columbus by OSU, you probably wondered what on earth is that colorful building? Believe it or not, that was also designed by a woman architect. And then Zora's house in the bottom right is actually one that's under construction by now, um, which I found when I was doing re research for that, which is interesting mm -hmm. because designed by women architects being designed by, or built by a female owned construction company for women. So there's um, there's projects out there that as history evolves and as our um, we consider what's historic over time, uh, I think this will change. There will be more uh, buildings and projects attributed to women. So with that, um, Devin, if, are there any questions? Yes, there are. I uh, just want to take a moment to thank both Amanda and Melinda today for doing this webinar. Uh, in this conversation, not necessarily with School in Caldo, but in our office started back in 2018, if you can believe it. And we were gearing up for the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. We wanted to do a presentation on this and then COVID happened. So it kind of got delayed, but we're very happy that it's finally starting to take place as a conversation around the state. And we hope that people are really, you know, geared up to even get more listed. Uh, before we take some questions here, if you have any, please type them in. Uh, but uh, Barb did, uh, Barb Powers gave a couple comments on the Terrace Plaza for you guys. So Barb says the Terrace Plaza is listed on the National Register Yay. at the national level of significance. Actually, most of the Ohio example National Register listed from today's presentation. The Ohio SHPO is always happy to work with for nominations on more properties associated with women architects or amending existing nominations. And as everyone who's ever had the opportunity to work with Barb and the rest of the SHPO staff, you can totally believe that one. You know, it's, yeah. you know, very, very, one of the best SHPOs in the country. Just be jealous every other state that's listening. <laughs> Uh, so we have a couple questions. Uh, first, Julie has a couple questions. Uh, these are kind of technical, so you guys may or may not have the answer for this. But the first of Julie's questions is, when did Ohio start registering architects? Oh, um, I don't think it was until the early 1900s, which it, I, I'd probably I'd have to Google the exact date. And it's it's changed over the years, which makes it hard. Um, you know what? It, what do you say as a professional architect? Surely back in the 1800s, it, it wasn't a licensure type thing. And the process of being licensed has changed a lot over the years. And they're actually trying to change it to, uh, some more um, to, so that they don't lose um, as many people. So I, that's why the, the women that we featured from the 1860s, 1860s uh, late 1800s, they wouldn't necessarily have been licensed. They would have been considered professionals. So. And kind of going off of what you were just talking about, uh, her second question kind of touches on that. Uh, what is the difference between sitting for a state licensing exam, such as Boyer did, and the actual licensure of a female architect, as in the case of Rector? So in Ohio, in modern times, that's a that, that's uh, a fairly straightforward question. That one I can't answer. So 
currently, um, if you want to be a licensed architect in the state of Ohio, you have to complete a professional degree, which is at least a five-year um, Bachelor of Architecture, or you have to have a uh, MARC, so Master of Architecture, which means you have to have completed a separate four-year program. Um, so you're looking at at least five, if not six or seven years of school. Um, following that, or sometimes in conjunction with that, you have to complete um, uh, architectural experience hours, which is kind of like internships only paid for them, um, where there's, a, I think, about 3,000 hours worth. It's three to four years minimum uh, with experience in different categories. Um, and as you're finishing that, you are allowed to work concurrently on your exams. There are currently six exams that have to be passed. They're all, Amanda, you're taking them right now. It's been a while um, for me. It, they're each, I think, three to four hours a piece. Yeah. Um, you have to pass all six, complete all your internship, have your degrees, and then um, navigate all the paperwork, which is just as much of a pain. Um, and then you will be considered a licensed architect. So there are a lot of steps in the process. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, and just following up uh, on two different things, I'm gonna skip Julie's third comment here and go to Nora. Uh, Nora is pointing out the uh, Ohio uh, Architects Board was established in 1929. So thank you. not too long ago in reality, considering a lot of our buildings you've been standing in were designed <laughs> before that. So yes. <laughs> good people working even back then, but they didn't have a license. <laughs> Things have changed. Uh, and then Julia is pointing out uh, the local nomination for landmark status uh, was not approved, approved yet for the Terrace Plaza, and okay. that would have given additional protections for it. Yeah, that's what I thought. The most recent article I was reading about it from the Cincinnati Enquirer said it was denied, which is kind of disappointing. And um, then... Uh, the follow-up question for the licensure. Uh, so she was looking for some clarification as to why Rector is considered the first licensed if she didn't sit for the exams like Boyer. Why, which one was? Uh, Rector uh, versus Boyer. Yes, yeah, so yeah, Rector designed Oxley Hall. Um, I believe that was just before the, um, the modern examination process was put in place. So she would have been, as Melinda mentioned, um, a practicing professional architect. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Melinda. Um, and after 29, when Boyer sat for the exams, um, she was the first to sit for the actual state licensure exam. Yeah, it was in the earlier years, it was a little weird because it, the architect's examination board wasn't created till 1929, as someone so kindly looked up for us. but um, before the AIA existed before that. So usually once um, you submitted credentials and stuff and you could um, be admitted to the AIA, be considered a professional architect that way. There are some alternative paths to licensure still. Um, it's a profession that's been around a long time. It was not terribly fast to change some things. Um, in a few states still, you can practice for a certain number of years and then become licensed that way. Um, that doesn't work that way in Ohio, though. Um, so I think that's kind of a hold holdover from where things are used to be. So, hey guys, uh, our next question is: Did you find any early architects of color while you were researching this, and do you know of any that were practicing in Ohio at the time? Not female architects of color, no. Um, I would have liked to. Um, it was a struggle, honestly, to find these women, um, which is, <laughs> and even now, um, so the number of female architects of color that are um, licensed architects, member of AIA, is incredibly small. I think it's, I'm almost afraid to say the number because I've been reading a lot of statistics for this, but I think it's around 2,500, not in Ohio, nationwide. Um, so it's a, a portion of our population that is severely underrepresented in the architectural profession. Um, they, different groups are trying to take uh, steps to change that, um, just like with getting more uh, women architects mm -hmm. licensed and in the, staying in the profession, it's a slow change, unfortunately. But um, th there are others in other states that I came across. Um, 
just not in Ohio or with ties to Ohio. Sure. Uh, Nora is pointing out another architect uh, that was prominent at the time. Uh, she's pointing out Carol Oshevsky from Akron. She served as the first woman state architect as well as vice president of the National AIA and chancellor of the AIA College of Fellows. I'm yeah. gonna share the link with everyone to her Wikipedia page just so everyone can see that. So you should have that in your chat right now. Uh, yeah. Any, it, it, go it's ahead guys. It's interesting with her because she was on my list and at what point I'm like, you know, if I know them, can they really be considered historic? Like, um, you know, if I have met them in person in my mind, that means like they haven't been around long mm -hmm. enough. So um, the reason she was not included in this is, uh, <laughs> is, is simply I didn't want to consider her being old enough to. So um, just in case she get, mm -hmm. she hears why she wasn't included, it's purely that. Um, it, there are now, uh, especially a lot of women architects, um, including ones in, uh, that, that specialize in historic preservation all over Ohio. Um, but you know, if you were to do this presentation another 20, 30 years, there would be a lot more people to include, um, which is exciting. Thanks. Uh, Chris has a question here. This might not be one you guys can answer, but this is definitely one that probably Barb at the SHPO can answer. So Chris, if uh, you feel like it, uh, reaching out to the SHPO afterwards, uh, this might have an answer for you. But okay, Chris's question, uh, does Ohio track the number or percentage of National Register designations that are associated with women, women architects, or women's history achievement in general? And if so, what is the percentage? I'm guessing that's a Barb question. <laughs> that is definitely a Barb question. And um, so when I was looking up the, the national, number of National Register nominations, you can actually download a Excel database from, um, the, from MPS and they update it periodically, mm -hmm. I think a couple times a year. Um, and there are categories, there are columns for um, why is something listed, but none of that is filled out. The, um, and they also, at least in that, don't list the architect. So my guess is that it is, at least for now, um, and Barb definitely, correct me if I'm wrong, not being tracked. Um, and that's be great to eventually change. That's had their 60,000 some entries on that Excel sheet, um, which would mean going through 60,000 some National Register nominations and filling out those categories. So I think that would be a great job for someone, preferably not me. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, that is all the questions I have at the moment. Uh, so you guys you got about one minute to type it as I finish up my final <laughs> comments here. All right, Barb says, I do not have that at the ready, but we can work to determine that. Uh, yeah. Women's architects are not a specific category that can be searched. So, yep, I do know nationally the they answer. say that only about eight percent of properties listed on the National Register are listed for reasons associated with um, women, minorities, people of color, LGBTQ. So, I did find that statistic. So, it's fairly low, um, especially if you think then you know of that eight percent what part of them are uh, associated with women in some way. Thank you once again to Melinda and Amanda for doing this presentation today. This is absolutely wonderful. Uh, we're always glad that we can partner with our business member, Scully Caldwell, uh, on these kind of projects. And we're, we're always looking forward to the next one. Uh, and if anyone is interested, our next webinar is on April 12th. Uh, that webinar is going to be completely different from this one. Uh, it's going to be covering the upcoming solar eclipse that is happening in Ohio, I believe on April 8th, 2024. It's a total solar eclipse and this is from the Ohio Prevention for Blindness Association. Uh, so we're gonna learn learning about safety and also co-branding opportunities for your communities across Ohio that wanna hand out some protective sunglasses so people can watch the solar eclipse when it happens in Ohio. Um, take a look. All right. No more questions. Very good. <laughs> so thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, thanks again to Schooly Caldwell for participating today. And uh, we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Evan. Thank you.